there we go and um, all right so I'd like to welcome you all to today's Green Living seminar webinar and uh, as I just mentioned this presentation is being recorded so if you'd like to watch the video recording of this or other Green Living seminar webinars please see the environmental studies YouTube channel or the Green Living Seminar webpage. I'm Elena Traster in the Environmental Studies Department, and this semester's Green Living Seminar is or organized around the theme of environmental pollution. Due to the spread of COVID-19, all the remaining presentations this semester have been transitioned to video conferences so that we can all participate remotely. As always, they are free and open to the public, and we think today's presentation might last about 45 minutes. We'll see uh, about what kinds of questions we get. Um, and we will actually leave the chat box open this time. So feel free to enter your questions in there uh, as we go along. Uh, I would uh, ask if uh, it looks like you are um, already doing this. Um, uh, please continue to keep yourselves muted so that we can um, cut out the background noise. I will do the same once I finish my welcome. And uh, anybody that doesn't mute themselves now, if I have to go in and mute you later, um, you may not be able to unmute yourself. Um, so better to do it now. Um, so finally, a quick announcement for uh, next week's uh, presentation, which will be our last public presentation in the Green Living Seminar, Thursday, April 16th. Paul Godfrey, Emeritus Director of the UMass Amherst Water Resources Research Center, will give a lecture titled, Acid Rain, How Science and Volunteerism Contributed to Addressing an Environmental Challenge. Today's presentation titled, Pollution, Evolution, and How to Reduce Our Dependence on Antibiotics and Pesticides will be given by Emily Monison, author with the Ronin Institute. And now I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Oh, thanks, Elena. Um, and, uh... Thanks for doing this, and um, I'm sure everybody always says this, but I, um, I, I wish we, I wish I could see you in person. Um, and so uh, this is one of my first times, first time doing one of these like this. So I'm gonna just get going, and I'll tell you a little bit about what how, my background, just to why I started doing what I'm gonna talk about. So um, just tell me, is this, are we up there? Is that good? Did I share my screen? Oh, maybe I didn't do that yet. Yep, we just see you talking. We don't oh, see your screen yet. Okay. Um, share screen. Now we, you are presenting. Um, and do you see it now? It is popping up there. Yes, we do. Hey. Okay. All right. So um, I am a toxicologist by training for the last, I hate to think of this, 30 years or so. I've been... For the most part of that, thinking about toxicology, how chemicals interact with living things. And uh, I don't do research anymore. I haven't done it for a long time. Um, but I had been several years ago writing uh, for our local paper on top of teaching, consulting, and things like that. But I was writing this column about um, uh, toxicology, and it was called The Neighborhood Toxicologist. And I would explain to people about a lot of the toxicants in their everyday lives from you know, things that were in consumer goods to the things that were in the environment. But one of the things that I really wanted to write was not the kind of uh, advice column, like don't use this, use that, or don't do this and do that, don't eat apples or whatever. But I wanted people to understand how these chemicals interact with uh, their bodies. And so um, I, in all these articles, I would sort of start to, you know, give some idea of the mechanisms and how chemicals interact with, the, with your body. And one of the things I also wanted people to understand is that we do have defenses. I mean, toxicology is all about how chemicals interact with your body and your, you are, our bodies are pretty remarkable. And so we do have some defenses against toxic chemicals. And so I wanted to um, get these points across. And that from doing that, that made me kind of also wonder um, uh, how how this came to be. So this is where I got to evolution in a toxic world. This is the kind of thing I'm going to talk about. So first part of this talk will be about um, sort of how we got some of these defense systems. And then I'll talk a little bit about what that means in today's world. And so I think all of you know, you know, our, our world's a pretty nasty place and it's not just today it's been you know ever since 
life began um, on Earth or emerged, um, it's had to contend with a lot of uh, very sort of toxic situations. And so one of the first challenges on early Earth, even though it's sort of a physical toxicant, was our sun in ultraviolet light. Um, UV, you, you all know this, that ultraviolet light can be pretty damaging to cells. It's why you wear sunscreen. So this is one of the earliest challenges. Another challenge that came along about 1.8 billion years ago uh, is oxygen. So these are just the stromatolites, those um, you know, early microorganism clumps that started producing, believed to produce some oxygen in early Earth. And oxygen is very toxic. Um, and you also probably know that because everybody you know, wonders about antioxidants and things like that. Um, and then another uh, sort of development on Earth uh, that made it kind of a toxic place is that uh, defense mechanisms in organisms like plants. Uh, plants are rooted to the ground. They're pretty easy targets. And once uh, plants emerged and became terrestrial, um, they're pretty easy targets for insects and then later for larger animals. And so plants pollute, produce a lot of toxic chemicals, which I'm sure you know everybody's also familiar with a lot of the different chemicals that can't, plants produce. So our planet's a pretty nasty place. And if some organism landed here from some other planet, uh, they would probably it would probably have a hard time surviving just as you would if you ended up on some other planet. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to go through these ones quickly so I can get to one of my favorites. But, you know, just to give you some idea, the um, ultraviolet light challenge, one of the first sort of uh, enzymes and defensive mechanisms that living things evolved, the, the cells that emerged on early Earth, is a way to repair DNA because the ultraviolet light from the sun. And remember, in early Earth, before we had oxygen, uh, which would come around here, there was no ozone layer. So you know that ozone screens out some of the ultraviolet light, some of the most harmful ultraviolet light rays. Uh, and so here we have cells emerging. Uh, we're an RNA and then a DNA-based life. Um, the, the ultraviolet light interacts with DNA and um, can cause it to mutate which is why we get, we're concerned about cancer and ultraviolet light and sun. And so those early cells, once they were sort of um, in the target of ultraviolet light, would have needed some kind of protection. Um, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, if you're thinking evolutionarily, sometimes some mutation is, is necessary, right? You have to, if those early cells never mutated, we wouldn't be here today. But um, if they weren't able to also have some integrity where they could pass on sort of DNA and any kinds of beneficial characteristics they had, we also wouldn't be here. So DNA repair, there's an enzyme um, that uh, is considered you know, to be very old. They can trace it back to sort of the, the earliest organisms um, or earliest common organisms we know on Earth. Um, and so it's a very ancient kind of enzyme. And it makes sense that uh, early life would have had some kind of DNA repair um, mechanism. Uh, the next kind of, uh, you know, if we skip ahead and think about oxygen, um, you know, ox so we have these cells, they're living on Earth, they, they're living in an anoxic um, atmosphere, oxygen comes along, starts being produced, um, there's a lot of discussion on how that came about, um, but the, the, you know, the, the final thing is that the Earth became oxygenated, and you know, when you think of things that rust, they oxidize. Oxygen is very powerful, very reactive. And so it, that would have also been very difficult for life to contend with if it didn't have some way to defend against toxic oxygen. Um, and so other enzymes evolved. Some, um, there's an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which helps sort of um, break, you know, uh, detoxify reactive oxygen species. Um, when we when we breathe, we make very we breathe in oxygen, but we also produce some very reactive oxygen species that can be very harmful. And so we have these enzymes that probably evolved very early on um, in life's history to detoxify oxygen. And uh, catalase is another one that detoxifies oxygen. And um, you know, I have this little runner up there because we can talk about it if anybody's curious, but. You know, there are there are studies that show, uh, you know, if you take in more oxygen, you have the potential to make more reactive oxygen species. And so how does your body handle that? And there are ways that it does that. So it's pretty miraculous. And then the last thing that I want to talk about, about in terms of sort of just to give an overview of how life 
or, or the kinds of defensive mechanisms that living things evolve is that with plants. Um, and so I mentioned that plants started producing a lot of toxic chemicals to protect themselves. Um, a lot of these are alkaloids. Some people use them for drugs. We know that. Some people for recreational drugs and for pharmaceutical drugs. There are, um, you know, plant chemicals out there that will give you a rash, all sorts of things. Um, and living things evolved um, a whole array of enzymes to detoxify a lot of these plant chemicals. And we, uh, as I'll show you in a little bit, um, a lot of these are very relevant in our lives today. So this is just an overview. These are just sort of three systems that evolved in response to sort of a toxic earth, but they're all very relevant to us today in terms of how we live in the world um, and sort of what we're exposed to. And so I just want to talk a little bit more about um, that very last one, sort of the plant chemicals, because this is a, there's just a, some really cool stories, and I'm just going to give you little snippets of some of these stories. Um, and one of these stories is um, some of this work is by May Bear Mom, who is an entomologist. Um, and it's the story of the black swallowtail butterfly, which is, this is its caterpillar. And this butterfly likes to feed on these plants called um, parsnip. Uh, some of you, or Queen Anne's lace, wild parsnip, uh, is some of you have heard of giant hogweed. These are all related in those ho hogweed plants. Uh, you may know produce a sort of latexy kind of poison that if you touch it, it can be, you know, cause a very, very uh, bad rash. It can cause blindness. Uh, some of those chemicals that are toxic are called furanocumarins. These are in the wild parsnip, um, and the plant produces these chemicals, and the, the, the caterpillars of these butterflies um, can eat these without a problem. And the reason that it can eat them is because it evolved this one particular kind of enzyme that belongs to a family of enzymes. So enzymes are uh, proteins um, and they kind of make things happen. And then this particular enzyme can help detoxify a lot of chemicals. And in this case, this butterfly, the caterpillar, has a very specific cytochrome, it's called a cytochrome P450. It's just a, there's never been a good name for these things. Um, that can detoxify these furanocumarins. And what some of what Berenbaum's work showed, which is just really cool, is that the, there were these sort of linear kinds of furanocumarins, and um, the caterpillar would detoxify those. And so the plants, over time, started producing a different kind of furanocumarin, one that was a little bit different that the P450 that the caterpillar originally had couldn't detoxify, but over time, a little tweaking to this particular P450 in the caterpillars could, uh, you know, evolve eventually to um, also detoxify these angular uh, furanocumarins. And so this is kind of a, it's just a really interesting story of sort of plant-animal um, warfare that just, you know, one upsmanship of um, Plants are constantly evolving and trying to protect themselves, but the animals that depend on them also have a, a, the potential to evolve and use those um, plants for food uh, because they have these detoxification mechanisms in part. The other really cool thing is just the, um, I think in part of uh, the production of these chemicals, there are also some of these P450s, so that's kind of an interesting thing. And this is just to give you a little bit, um, uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about these P450s in this little first section just because um, I think they're fascinating and they're the kind of thing that I used to study. Um, and it just gets more fascinating the more work people do. And so this is just some work that this group from Woods Hole did um, several years ago. And what this shows is, so these are the P450s, the, the, that one enzyme that I told you about in the caterpillar. And these are um, all different organisms kind of going up from um, sort of some really odd, these are all eukaryotic organisms. This is a, a very odd, considered to be sort of the beginning of animal kind of organisms up through sort of um, the um, complexity, if you want to call it complexity, through animals up to vertebrates. Uh, and so they're just color coded on this figure here. And just what it shows, every single one of these is a P450. So this is this is just to show you how many different kinds of those P450s have evolved over the over millions of years. And what I want to point out is that these P450s here in this pink zone 
are the kinds of P450s that metabolize and detoxify and break down what are called external substrates. And so an external substrate would be something like a toxic chemical that you ate from a plant. And so this is just to show uh, it's, it's an amazing diversity of enzymes that have evolved to detoxify a lot of different kinds of chemicals, including plant chemicals. And some of the other P450s that are here um, have evolved to detoxify steroid hormones that, you, you know, just normal chemicals in your body that sort of do their thing and then need to be removed. And they also help produce things like steroid, chem steroid hormones. So they're very important for, um, you know, um, sex, sexual differentiation, estrogen and testosterone production, things like that. And the really, really interesting thing is you see here at this very beginning, this is sort of where it all started, was a kind of, it's called um, cytochrome P451. That's just its name. Each, every single one of these has a name, which makes this incredibly confusing. Um, but this, this very one here was involved in making sterol, which is sort of a precursor to, to um, the steroids, steroid hormones and things like that. Um, and it's also in cell membranes. And so it's, you know, it's wondered if maybe sterol was sort of uh, um, either a signal that maybe very early cells used. And so if you had a signal, then a signal would need to be broken down or if it was sort of a protective thing. Nobody really knows. but um, Sterol, you know, a P450 that was involved in produ producing sterol was one of the first ones to emerge in living things. And then it just exploded. And so these are called blooms, a P450 bloom, which I think is kind of a cool word that these enzymes just bloomed. And so um, you have lots of different families of these enzymes that we all rely on. And we have, I can't remember the um, number, but I think we have, you know, a couple, maybe thousands of different P450s. Um, in our own, or maybe hundreds, I can't remember, but it, we have a lot of different kinds of P450s doing all sorts of things in our bodies. And one of the things that these P450s in our bodies does, which is very relevant to toxic chemicals, and particularly those that we take on purpose, which are pharmaceuticals and also recreational drugs, um, is that these P450s um, are involved in drug metabolism. And they become very important because um, so when, when drug makers are making drugs, they're very aware of how these drugs interact with our P450s, um, whether some of these drugs are meant to be actually activated by P450s. So, um, you know, a chemical will come into your body. It, it won't be really that active until it's actually metabolized by P450, which is kind of on its way to detoxifying it, but on its way that chemical might become active and then actually do what um, you want it to do as a drug in your body. Um, but it also detoxifies a lot of these drugs. And so, you know, when you take a drug, you know how, how often you should take it. If you take your uh, Tylenol, whatever, every six hours, it's because part of it is because, you know, there's a good understanding of how it interacts in your body and how it's detoxified and how long it will take to get out of your body before you need to take more of that. And a lot of that has to do with the P450. So each one here, um, can you see, uh, am I pointing the things? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, can we see can see your mouse just fine. Uh, okay. So, um, like, so CIP, CIP, one, CIP is another name for P450, sorry. Um, this is what I'm saying. We don't really know what to call them. Um, but P451A1, for instance, metabolizes caffeine and testosterone and, and warfarin, which is warfarin is a... Um, rat poison, but um, also it's used um, as a blood thinner for people in, in, in another form. It's called Coumadin, and that's a very important blood thinner. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more. But so these are just some of our P450s that are very involved in drug, um, uh, drug metabolism. And what makes knowing this very important is because you can see there's lots of different P450s um, metabolizing a lot of different drugs. And so this brings up the question of drug-drug uh, interactions. And everything I'm saying here can also be applied to other toxic chemicals. So when you think of things that interact with each other, it's partly because what your body is doing to them um, may interact. You might be able to detoxify a chemical, but if you're exposed to another chemical at the same time, and that chemical is normally detoxified by, say, P450, and something interferes with that, that causes a problem. And so 
the easiest way to think about this is with um, drug interactions, which has become a very big problem as more and more people are taking lots of different kinds of drugs. And um, this came home to me, uh, it was maybe 15 years ago before people really understood drug-drug interactions and how important um, a lot of our, the foods that we take in our um, also metabolized with P450s, maybe it was 20 years ago. Um, but my dad was on, um, he was on Coumadin, so that's this warfarin thing here. And, you know, it's metabolized by uh, P450s. Uh, and so it's a tricky drug, drug to give. People who are on it, they would always take their blood just to see what their Coumadin levels were because you don't want to have too much of a buildup because it's a blood thinner. And uh, you, that's how it killed rats. It would, you know, they couldn't clot and so rats would die. So, um, so you need to be very careful and keep those warfarin levels um, stable. And so my dad would be the kind of person who would get on these kicks of things and he would really like uh, coffee ice cream and eat coffee ice cream all the time or he would you know get on to a certain kind of cereal and just eat that and so there was a time when he decided that he really liked grapefruit juice and he started drinking I think it was um, you know one whole um, maybe half quart half gallon I can't remember the sizes he, he drank a lot several glasses of grapefruit juice a day and what happened was his coumadin levels went like through the roof and they couldn't in the beginning, they didn't really know why until they kind of figured out finally that he had changed his diet and what he was doing was drinking a lot of grapefruit juice. This is something that's known now, but back then it wasn't. Um, and what grapefruit juice can do is that it has a chemical in it, which is actually a furanocoumarin, that other kind of chemical that I talked about that um, in the caterpillar story, a different kind of furanocoumarin. But this one interacts with P450s, the particular P450s that would uh, metabolize warfarin or coumadin and uh, inhibit it. And so what was happening was the grapefruit juice that he was taking, the chemical in the grapefruit juice was interacting with the P450, it was inhibiting the metabolism and the, the chemical wasn't getting detoxified, the coumadin wasn't getting detoxified and it wasn't getting excreted from his body and it built up. Um, this is why I think anybody who's probably today knows um, when they take new drugs, uh, certain, certain drugs, a lot of physicians will tell you to just stay away from things like grapefruit juice and some other related um, foods that they know now can interact with uh, a lot of different drugs because they interact with some of these P450s that commonly, um, that are listed here, that commonly detoxify a lot of the drugs that we take. Um, and, you know, I, whenever I was teaching, I would always tell students that, you know, a lot of students are, would think, well, I'm not really taking any pharmaceuticals, but I take these herbal medications. And so uh, there was the story of St. John's wort, which is a herbal medication that people would take, um, not thinking, uh, it, but what it would do um, is that it would interfere also with cytochrome P450s, um, which uh, caused actually for some of young women on birth control pills, there was an interaction where it would increase the metabolism of the hormones that were in those particular birth control pills, and so they didn't work so well. So they're kind, you know, these are things that really need to be people that CBD is another one now that's becoming more and more important that can interfere with P450s. And so people are quickly trying to figure out how and what drugs um, it might they might interfere with, um, too. So that's just something to think about. And so this is just to give an, a bigger idea of that. This is, you know, this is one of those cytochrome P450s important in um, drug metabolism. And so these are all the substrates. So these are all the drugs that the cytochrome P450 um, metabolize. There's more. This is just a certain class of drugs. Um, these are the kinds of things that will inhibit it. So these are other kinds of um, plant-based or drugs that in, um, and antibiotics, things like that, that can interfere with the metabolism. And so that would not be good. And then there's something called inducers, which I did not... Um, mentioned yet, but this is very important. And this also happens a lot in things like um, those kinds of enzymes that, well, we can talk about it if you're interested, if you're not, I won't. But <laughs> anyway, inducers means that if they increase uh, these kinds of things, smoking will increase cytochrome P451A2. So, um, you know, that would, that would also, so you would have more cytochrome P451A2, and so that would influence how you metabolize these substrates here. So you can see that, you know, you start 
thinking about these detoxification enzymes in and so you know and imagine the um, interactions here um, that can happen when you are exposed to lots of different things whether it's food or drug or environmental chemicals um, so and I should mention that this all kind of makes sense if you think about a lot of the drugs that we use um, are actually derived from plant-based um, chemical structures so you can make that link if you want to know why why do we have these uh, enzymes in our bodies that metabolize these drugs we take why would we ever have evolved that and it's because some of these structures are might be similar to plant kinds of things that some of these cytochrome p450s evolved to metabolize so that's a really interesting area to think about and this is just one other um, uh, example of problematic kind of interactions that have to do with p450s that are very common um, so I think you know when my kids were small there really wasn't too much worry about Tylenol but um, it's now known and I think probably everybody knows to be careful when you're taking Tylenol because it can cause liver damage and this is one of the ways that it causes liver damage what happens is there's here's your Tylenol uh, there's a minor pathway that it gets metabolized and a major pathway that it gets metabolized through so this is the, the major pathway here it gets uh, there's an enzyme that will plunk this big glucuronide onto it and or a sulfide group um, and then they will be excreted and that's not toxic that's good um, if there this pathway is busy doing something else or if there's a lot of p450 in your it, um, then the Tylenol can get metabolized into a toxic pathway um, called NAPK and these are what interacts with proteins and nucleic acids and can cause liver damage and so one of the things that can happen is that if, if you're drinking alcohol alcohol can induce remember I just showed you on that last slide you can increase the amount of p450s when you do certain things and certain alcohol can increase certain p450s that metabolize Tylenol that can make this more of a major pathway and can produce more toxic metabolites and so that's just you know uh, something to be aware of in terms of chemical interactions and this is just to show that okay so I talked about p450s and um, I'm a little p450 biased but this is just to show that p450s are only one part of the whole defense zone so I had mentioned you know about the catalase and the um, um, catalase and superoxide dismutase and um, the I didn't go into detail but there's uh, the enzyme that helps you helps many animals not us we can talk about that if you're interested in it um, you know uh, fix uh, mutations caused by ultraviolet light is called DNA photolyase um, that breaks apart the sort of mutations that ultraviolet light causes so there's lots of different kinds and, and I only spoke about four really um, and so there's those all fall into the class of enzymes so we have a lot of different enzymes that um, help uh, are part of what we call the defense zone all the different kinds of um, defenses we have against toxic chemicals so we have the enzymes there are receptors um, that are involved in sort of detecting if we're exposed to toxic chemicals and then they help um, sort of uh, kick off enzyme reactions or transport chemicals there are transporters um, that will transport chemicals in or out of your cell um, so that's another important um, way that you can get rid of toxic chemicals and I'm going to mention that in a little bit um, and so these are just sort of the different um, uh, different kinds of uh, activity that um, there's more to, to defense than p450s is all I want to say so I'm going to wrap this up because I guess I've gone on a lot about p450s um, and that's just to say this is sort of an overview this is the p450 part but we have other things um, and so the big question is of course today uh, we're exposed to a lot of different chemicals that aren't chemicals that we were exposed to when we evolved all of these defenses and so when those two when your p450s can't handle all the chemicals that you're exposed to then you get a toxic response which would which is what I would call toxic overload um, here we have our drugs here you have 
you know, pesticides, industrial chemicals, um, all sorts of things. And so this is what toxicologists studies when we get to this overload. But we do understand that we have these defensive um, proteins as well, enzymes and transporters and things like that. So here's where I just wanted to know if anybody has any questions about this first part before we get on to the second part. I don't see the chat box. Is that? So if you um, look for the little, there's sort of a little comment bubble. Uh, if you're on a PC, it's sort of on the lower left. Um, yeah. And if you click that, there's just a couple of, uh, uh, there's no questions yet uh, that are um, just relating to the comment. Yeah. Okay, so I just clicked that. Okay. So now I'm going to get to sort of the part that you actually probably read about, um, which is uh, sometimes, uh, so living things have a lot of different kinds of defenses, those transporters that will transport toxic chemicals out of your cell, the P450s. Sometimes the defenses frustrate us. Um, that is that they cause problems for us when we are actually trying to use toxic chemicals to control things like pests and pathogens. And so that's the next part of this talk. Um, and so this is just, you know, one of the recently one of the um, concerning things for public health before COVID was antibiotic resistance. Uh, and things like uh, especially sexually transmitted diseases that are becoming completely antibiotic resistance. And this is a big problem and it's very concerning. And it's not just uh, STDs, but other kinds of tuberculosis, other kinds of um, bacteria and um, are becoming ant antibiotic resistant. And so I just want to go through a little bit about antibiotic resistance um, and sort of how that comes about and why it's important. And so, so for you know, those of you who have taken microbiology, you might know um, bacteria basically are clonal; they'll divide. That's how they reproduce. And so, this is just to, if you, one of the ways people know uh, physicians, and especially some of the early um, uh, occurrence of antibiotic resistance that people realized was um, called de novo, that a new mutation arose in bacteria um, in a patient. So just with it, if I had had a, a disease, say a streptococcus disease or some strep or something like that, um, and I was being treated with antibiotics but wasn't exposed to anything else, um, that eventually my bacteria might evolve resistance to that um, antibiotic. And so that would suggest that it mutated in my, you know, the, the colonies of streptococcus in me mutated. And so this is how something like that would happen is that Mutations happen all the time, and I'm sure you know this. Um, every time cells replicate, there's the potential for uh, mutation. Uh, most of the times, these are either repaired or they don't really do anything. Um, very rarely, they might be um, detrimental, kill the cell, or very rarely, they might be beneficial. And so here we've got our, um, you know, this could be um, Clostridium difficile, which causes a very um, awful, uh, potentially lethal kind of infection uh, in the gut. Uh, it could be streptococcus, strep infection. But you've got your bacteria. It's just go, doing its thing, dividing. Um, and as it divides, there's the potential for that mutation, which is this little star. In this case, this mutation is just not detrimental to these bacteria. It's just going along, doing these, you know, dividing and making more bacteria and making you sicker. Uh, and as it's doing that, you know, it, you've got this sort of um, population of bacteria now that all have this little mutation. Well, you get sick enough eventually, once the bacteria multiply enough to make you feel sick, that you go to the doctors, you take your antibiotic, and the doctor gives you an antibiotic. Um, that antibiotic uh, kills the bacteria that are making, you know, most of the bacteria that are making you sick. If it just so happens that this uh, mutation, maybe it makes a little, um, it's a change in sort of a trans chemical transport protein, and it helps the bacteria pump that toxicant out, or maybe it um, helps metabolize, like with penicillin, some of the, the common uh, mutations that make uh, bacteria-resistant penicillin is that it um, changes an enzyme so that it's able to break apart penicillin easier and make penicillin less toxic. And so, um, what happens is then eventually, as you take this antibiotic, this population that has this mutation that was just hanging out there, 
becomes the dominant population, and so you've got now a resistant infection. Um, and I just want to say that also this is something that happens in any really prolific, rapidly um, reproducing organism. Uh, so viruses, uh, antivirals can become uh, less effective or not effective uh, when viruses um, evolve and can mutate um, and become resistant. Same thing with fungi. And, it's, and these are problems in all of these kinds of pathogens is resistant to the treatments. And there's different reasons like in fungi um, and also in um, bacteria, you know, that uh, use in other other uses, so like uh, use of antibiotics in uh, the livestock industry has um, produced a lot of antibiotic resistance. Um, in fungi that impact humans, uh, agricultural use of certain antifungals has caused um, resistance to evolve in some fungi that are important for human infections. and so. Um, that's one thing that can happen. But another way that, that um, is even more frightening, and this is what really scares a lot of public health um, scientists, is that uh, there's a thing called standing genetic variation. So that there are just populations out there that have been, you know, through a lot of evolutionary history, and they've been exposed to a lot of things, and these genes are just there. So these resistance genes in the bacterial population may be there in certain bacteria, and so this is um, just to show that antibiotic resistant bacteria have been discovered in the guts of ancient mummies. So think about that. That's before there was antibiotics. So it was before there was sort of that overuse of antibiotics. There was before, um, and you know, the, the fact that, oh, what I didn't, I forgot to mention in this slide is, you know, so one of the problems is, is the more and more we use antibiotics, the more we sort of push this process. Um, and in particular, uh, when we use nonspecific antibiotics, because you might have some bacteria hanging out there that aren't necessarily pathogenic, but they're going to be exposed to this antibiotic, and they're going to potentially evolve resistance. Um, so, uh, so what's frightening here is that, uh, you know, or, or interesting, is that a lot of the resistant mechanisms um, don't have to come out in that de novo mutation way. Does, you don't need a new mutation. A lot of these bacteria the, in the larger bacterial pool out there in the environment um, are resistance genes. Uh, the same thing that here in caves, four million years old, before there was any human influence um, in terms of chemicals or antibiotics or anything, there are bacteria with all the resistance, with resistance genes to almost every single antibiotic we have. And that's, and that's called standing genetic variation. It's kind of in the background of, in, and can be selected upon. And um, what's important about that, you might say, well, so who cares about bacteria in a cave? But the thing is, is that bacteria have a lot of these resistance genes that they have tend to be, um, so bacteria tend to have one kind of loopy chromosome, a chromosome that's in a circle. And then they have these other little bits of DNA called plasmids, and they're little rounds of DNA. And those carry the auxiliary genes. And uh, resistance genes are considered auxiliary genes. They're just there. And bacteria are very good at sharing their plasmids. And so if a certain type of bacteria has uh, a resistance gene on its plasmid and it comes in contact with some other bacteria, it's able, it may share that gene. And so you can get sort of resistance across different bacterial strains and different species. Um, so this is one whole sort of field of study that's just really interesting. And it's not just bacteria. Um, you know, there's, there's issues with resistance. I'm sure a lot of people are aware um, of pesticide resistance. And so in this case, herbicide resistance to glyphosate. Um, glyphosate is that um, Roundup. Uh, these plants were made that resist Roundup. And this is a whole other story with genetic modified organisms, um, uh, soybean and corn and everything, that were made to resist the pesticide so that they could apply the pesticide. The corn would grow, the weeds would die. And when um, the story is that when they were, Monsanto scientists were first developing these GMO resistant, these antibiotic resist, uh, sorry, these herbicide resistant strains of, for crops, they um, had to swear that, you know, resistance wouldn't become an issue, and they did. They said this is a very hard kind of um, 
you know, it's hard to make these plants resistant to the pesticide. There's no way that weeds are going to develop or, you know, weeds are going to um, evolve resistance. And yet, uh, 20 or so years later, there are resistant weeds all over the place. Um, and so, and I'm sure you know that Roundup is probably a bad idea for a lot of other reasons. But the more and more, one of the problems is, and one of the reasons it's come into the news so much is because the more and more resistant weeds, the more and more growers were applying Roundup. And so Roundup has been used in quantities that it was really never intended to be used in the first place. But partly because of all this resistance, um, it's become a problem. Same thing with pesticides. Um, insects can also develop resistance in the same way as sort of the, you know, the de novo resistance. Um, that uh, one of the first things, you know, shortly after DDT, one of the early big uh, commonly used pesticides um, came out back in the 40s. Um, flies were found to be resistant to it. Um, and uh, insects have become resistant, flies have become resistant to just about every single um, pesticide that had been th thrown at them not too long after they started using them. Um, uh, and so this is just to say that um, this is just to show when we start using a lot of these chemicals in large amounts, what we are basically doing is driving a selective process um, to uh, select resistant organisms. So just like the antibiotic bacteria, we get um, uh, plants that are resistant to diseases, weeds that are resistant to diseases, insects that are resistant to diseases, I mean, sorry, to uh, the chemicals that we use. Um, and this is just to show that this is really the beginning of a lot of the industrial pesticide chemical agriculture. And in the 50s or so, and with the beginning of that, we started seeing right off uh, resistance. Um, and a lot of that resistance, I put this back in here, this is those P450s. A lot of these resistances are P450s that evolve um, in these organisms, tweaked a little bit. They were probably metabolizing something else. They changed a little bit, and then they were able to metabolize the pesticides that we use and protect, um, you know, produce resistant organisms because they have P450s that can kind of detoxify these chemicals. Um, I, oh gosh, is it really 614? Um, I'm going to skip ahead, I'm sorry, uh, to pheromones. Now, I, I was going to talk about pheromones, but since you read about um, uh, the phage therapy, um, I'm going to skip ahead to that. And phage therapy is one of the ways um, to reduce the pressure. So one of the problems is we use antibiotics, we select these resistant bacteria, we also create a lot of other resistant bacteria, not just the ones that are target, because it's not specific. So a lot of our antibiotics are broad spectrum. They kill all the bacteria. And I think people know this now that we're much more aware of the microbiomes. The beauty of bacteria phages are that they're very specific. They're specific right down to a strain. If you, you, know, you can have different E. coli's in you, but a bacteria phage is very specific for a strain of E. coli or a strain of strep or whatever, what have you, whatever kind of bacteria um, there's a phage for. So there's, and it's believed that there's a phage for every bacterium out there. And phage are viruses that infect bacteria. So these are bacteria phages. Um, and so what, um, what you read, and this is just to show what happens, um, this is your phage, so they look like little, they really do look like little lunar landers. This is your bacterium. The phage infects bacteria just like a, a virus will infect us and infect our cells. The phage infects the bacterial cell and eventually gets into the cell. Uh, it uses the cell machinery to reproduce and bursts out of the cell, killing the cell in the process. So this is uh, sort of a little bacteria phage life cycle. Um, and um, one of the things is hoped that bacteriophages can be used to treat uh, drug resi resistant illnesses. And I think you read about the uh, cystic fibrosis patient that, uh, you know, um, uh, infections can be very difficult there, in, especially in patients that are often treated with antibiotics. And so there's a tendency that their, their uh, infections will be drug resistant. And so you read a story about how uh, researchers at Yale were able to find a virus 
that could infect the um, infection that the cystic fibrosis patient had. And in that case, it was even more complicated because it, it didn't just kill the bacterium, it actually uh, caused the bacterium to become sensitive to antibiotics again, which is really kind of an interesting uh, story. But there are a lot of other cases where phage therapy now is being used to cure people who have antibiotic resistant infections um, because um, researchers can find a virus that will infect their specific bacterial um, infection and clear that infection. Um, so there's a lot. This is, and so this is just an overview of sort of defensive mechanisms and sort of how those are relevant um, for us today. So I guess I will ask if there's any questions and if anybody's interested in the pheromone, the, um, using insect hormones uh, instead of pesticides to um, uh, beat back uh, insects, let me know and we can go through that. I'm going to stop there. So are there questions or the other thing we can do, because I know there were some some questions and I want to leave them to the students to hopefully bring them up, um, particularly regarding the phage therapy. Um, but maybe um, what we could do is uh, I'm not seeing anyone writing yet. So if you want to maybe go on and, and talk a little bit about the pheromones and then I would really encourage um, anyone uh, on the conference to type questions in the chat box just now as we go along, um, especially shout out to the students. Um, don't be shy, please put questions in there. Um, and then um, maybe we can uh, kind of do both at once. Does that sound good? Sure. So uh, um, can you see the slides again? Yes, they're great. You can see them. Um, okay, so here we are at the, this is, um, I hope you're seeing apples. Um, so this is just the story of using pheromones in, in apple growers, and I think this is relevant to us in New England. Uh, as many of you might know, it's very difficult to grow organic apples here in New England. There's a lot of pests and pathogens. Um, you can get them, but it's difficult. A lot of our organic apples actually come from the West Coast, and one of the reasons this is difficult is because uh, apples are um, a favorite of this little beast here called the coddling moth. And what the coddling moth does is that it will lay its uh, eggs on apples and then once they hatch they will burrow in. And when you get a wormy apple you can thank those moths and uh, they're responsible for a lot of crop loss in the east. Um, one of the things that growers do is use this chemical called, what they have used, is chlorpyrifos, which is uh, actually a neurotoxic chemical that has caused a lot of problems, particularly for growers and for families and farm families that live near uh, these crops. Um, so this is just the use of chlorpyrifos over the years. These are the places in the country where it's used. Um, there's a big movement now to ban chlorpyrifos, uh, and growers are like, well, what else are we going to do? Um, because it's a it's a it's such a commonly used kind of chemical, and it's a very um, broad spectrum chemical, kind of like a penicillin of the um, pesticide world. And so one of the really cool things that growers are starting to do, and they're actually finding that they can get away without using chlorpyrifos, um, is to use uh, something called pheromones. These were uh, discovered by a French naturalist, uh, Jean-Henri Fabre, who he was a early naturalist, late 1800s. Uh, and the story of how he discovered pheromones was that he had um, he had this uh, peacock moth on his uh, desk in a little dome with sort of a little cage, like a little domed cage on his desk, and it was a female. And uh, at some point, uh, once she came out of um, her cocoon, all of a sudden there were these male moths flooding around. And what he realized is that she must have been putting out something, some kind of chemical, um, that was attracting these moths. And so. Uh, many years later, what people realized is that they are these moths are producing um, a pheromone, and so they're they and they think it can go like that. These can be released miles, and so that what the females do is they release this pheromone. The males come are attracted, uh, and so that was sort of the aha moment here in the 60s and 70s was can we use this to actually if the problem is mating. <laughs> 
because once they mate, they lay their eggs, the eggs get into the, you know, the eggs hatch and you get a worm. Can we use this to disrupt mating? And so what they did was um, they started to discover that they could actually use pheromones to either trap, um, like on a sticky trap, like this, trap moths by kind of getting them to come to the female hormone, or they could dis they could just um, disrupt the mating. And so by hanging traps with pheromones in, say, apple trees, so this is what it would look like. The female moth puts out her scent. Males come from far and wide, following this plume right to the female, and they mate. If they put these pheromone traps, like so they can make pheromone now, one of the advances that, that um, was required for pheromones to be able to be used was in analytical chemistry so that they could actually produce the pheromones and um, put them onto traps. And so they put these traps out here, and now you've got the female putting out her scent, but there's also female scent coming from all over the orchard. And so the males have a harder time finding the female and it disrupts the mating. And so this is a method that's actually um, uh, growers, at least in the West, and I think some around here have started using, and they're using it for lots of different uh, orchards. It's just good for moths. And you know, there's a lot of other insects too that are problematic and there are some many other insects with um, that pheromones are being produced and used for, but this is just one example, but it works really well with moths. So that was my the story of that. So I will Thank end. you. So there is one question, and I'm glad this one came up. I was hoping it would. Um, do you see it, Emily, and do you want to read it off? I don't see it, but I don't. I can read it off for you. Um, so Noah is asking, can you speak a bit to phages' ability to attack other viruses? Potentially, could one be developed to treat COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, given that there are virophages that exist? Has it, have anyone you know, tried to manipulate those? I have not seen uh, anything about that. I think, um, yeah, viruses infect everything, including viruses. So, um, but no, I haven't. I have not seen anything about that. But uh, I may be a year or two behind and sort of what people are doing with viruses in terms of protection. Um, but I do know that, it, that, you know, it's so specific that it does take a lot of work for people to actually find viruses to infect the bacteria that they want to infect. Um, so it's, you know, it's a great solution, but it's also needs a lot of um, work up front to sort of, even to, you know, just physical work of finding the viruses, isolating the viruses, testing the viruses against the specific strain of bacteria that's causing a problem before it can become, you know, a solution. Yeah, great. So it's a good question, though. So. Yeah. Thank you. And so another one that uh, I'm not seeing anyone ask, so I will ask it. Um, uh, there was a bit of discussion about what some of the risks are uh, of the um, phage therapies that are being developed. And it was touched on just a little bit in the article at the very end. And I'd wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, what uh, people have to be careful about um, in terms of phage therapy. So I think there's the, well, so first of all, there's always the potential for the um, bacteria to evolve a resistance to the phage. So that's one thing. Um, and people are aware of that and they use a mixture of phages when they are doing this, just like um, one way to avoid antibiotic resistance is to use a mixture of antibiotics. Um, and then, you know, there is the concern, could you push the bacterium to become more of a problem? Um, I don't, I, I, I think it's something people are aware of. The thing to realize is that we have, we, we are loaded with phages. Anywhere there's bacteria, there are bacteria phages. So, there isn't so much concern about us being exposed to bacteriophages when we are um, given them as a cure. Um, so I think they're considered low risk um, in that, you know, for that reason. Uh, I haven't seen a lot about pushing sort of evolution of bacteria to become more problematic because of phage. Um, so not sure that that's really a, a problem that people worry about. So they're considered to be relatively low risk. Um, and uh, they, I have not seen any instances where they've been used and then there's been a negative impact and, or a negative, you know, 
and yeah, a negative impact because of the phage. It might be that they're not working, but it's not that it's a negative impact. Does that make sense? It does, yes. Um, so I would then just uh, ask if there are any other questions. We're just about at the end here, but if um, anyone has anyone any other uh, questions they want to contribute to the chat, or you are also, we are a, a small group, so if anyone wants to unmute themselves um, and contribute a question, we could um, hear you as well. See if any um, last questions remain. And if not, then I will um, thank you again so much, Emily, for um, uh, presenting today. And um, I would like to also invite uh, anyone, I know I'll see the students next week as well. Any other guests, uh, we'll have our last webinar um, next week uh, with Paul Godfrey uh, learning about um, acid rain and volunteerism. Um, so thank you very much to everybody. Well, thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.